It's incredible, I think, if you start analyzing how much of church life and how much of life in general is driven by fear. Oftentimes we wouldn't, people would deny that it is fear, but it's, it, it's, it's fear. Um, and, and you see it equally, except expressed differently in both liberal and conservative circles. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the expression by Jim Wallace, the Sojourner's founder, who always says, he said, this is the trouble both in the churches, in our churches and in society. He says, um, the conservatives get it and invariably get it wrong, and the liberals invariably don't get it at all. <laughs> and that's true, I think, with fear. So that, and we'll talk about this today, um, how conservatives are concerned that we're not preaching enough fear in religion. Liberals are concerned that all fear is unhealthy, and both of those aren't very good positions. What I want to do is, is talk today about three, three sessions. I want to talk, first of all, uh, I'll introduce this in a few minutes, um, just to try to define fear. That fear, when you start looking at it, is an extremely, extremely complex reality. It's a cauldron of all kinds of things, and some of our fears you're going to see are very healthy. They're deeply instinctually rooted. They're there to protect us. Some of our religious fears are healthy, and some of our fears are very unhealthy and are the very antithesis of everything we believe in as Christians. But they all are rooted in the same kind of, they come out of the same kettle. So it's going to be very important to sort out the origins of fear, where fear comes from, what it's rooted in, and that's what we'll do with our first session. Then I want to look at with you about the difference between healthy and unhealthy religious fear. And then finally, and probably most importantly, to look at principles that invite us to have less fear of God. We're always too afraid um, of our maker, of our origins. So let's begin with this. And I want to begin with two kind of things I just want to drop out here for you, which in some sense contradict each other, but are, are to set the table for this and its complexity. And the first one's this, and very, very importantly, that in Scripture, if you read the Bible from cover to cover, you will see that in Scripture, virtually every time that God appears, theologians call that a theophany, so that God appears. God appears in the form of fire, the burning bush to Moses. God appears oftentimes as an angel appearing to somebody, or God appears in Jesus, or Jesus appears after the resurrection. But in virtually every one of them, more than 300 of those we can count in Scripture, when God appears in, in human life, the first words are always this, do not be afraid. So that's very important, and we'll come back on that many times today. When God appears in your life, the very first words you're going to hear are the antithesis of fear. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid. So that um, one of the marks of what's truly from God is something that soothes our fears as opposed to provokes our fears. So that, that's very, very important that religion, as I'm going to say a number of times today, particularly Christianity, um, is the antithesis of fear. As Jesus says, I've come to set you free from all fears. And fear is the opposite of love. So I want you to keep that in mind. That's the one part of the prong. The second part of the tension, begin with a story. Um, if you've ever seen the movie by Robert Redford called A River Runs Through It, it's a, based on a very famous book and so on, but these, this is the opening dialogue of the movie. As the credits take shape at the beginning, you hear the voice speaking this way. And the man says, I want to tell you the story about my brother. He said, my brother was a beautiful guy. So he's just this wonderful man. He was born, he said, he was never afraid of anything in his whole life. Of course he died young. Okay. Uh, you're going to see it's the opposite. Fear, you're going to see, is a great protection. Those who have no fears might be very beautiful people. They all die young. See, very beautiful man, never afraid of anything in his life. Of course he died young. You're going to see it's very important that fear, as we're going to see, is, is also a gift. It's, it's going to be the greatest neurosis in our lives, and it's also going to be the greatest gift in our lives. 
With that being said, let's move into the first part. I want to spend some time with you simply trying to define fear. And then we'll try to look at how religious fear comes out of that cauldron of uh, just all this mixture of things. Now, sometimes I often don't look at dictionaries and probably should look at dictionaries more. But sometimes it's very helpful just to look at dictionary definitions. And so I looked at different dictionary definitions and they, they emphasized four different aspects of fear. We're going to go into phenomenology of this, but first just the dictionary definition. So if you look at a normal dictionary, it's just something like this. Fear is a distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, evil, or pain, whether the threat is real or imagined. Or they'll say, it's a, the feeling or condition of being afraid. And its symptoms are foreboding, apprehension, consternation, dismay, dread, terror, fright, panic, horror, and so on. Secondly, and now you're going to see that that's, that's a neutral definition. Is your fear just, that's what you feel. Then, um, the next two definitions are going to speak of fear as something healthy. So they say fear is a concern or an anxiety or a solicitude. Solicitude is a good word. That means that's when you're healthily concerned about something. You're going to see a lot of fear is really healthy. You know, fear is a great gift in our lives. Or thirdly, they talk about fear as a reverential fear, especially towards God, the fear of God, and the symptoms there are awe, respect, reverence, and veneration. We'll look at that during the second part of these talks. So that a scripture says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So there is a fear that's very healthy, this fear that lies deep in the innards of our religion. You're going to see also a lot of fear is absolutely antithetical to religion. So that fear, it's a, uh, there is a fear that's reverential. The healthy fear of God, there's a fear that's very unhealthy. And lastly, I looked up Carl Rogers, because when I was a young student, we all had to study Carl Rogers. And I'm still a great admirer of his. And Rogers says, fear is the passion of our nature which excites us to provide for our security on the approach of evil. Notice that's a positive definition. He's defining fear instinctually. See, fear is an instinct. And the instincts are there by nature to protect you. Okay. Now, with that being said, I want to try to break this down into um, just a number of different pieces. And to, to enter into, if you analyze, like, what are we afraid of? And all of us in this room, we have many deep fears. Some of which I want to say are very healthy. Some of which are not healthy. Okay, let's look at that more deeply. What are we afraid of? <clears throat> well, at our deepest level, and this comes from our instincts, we're, it's fear for our own life, fear for our physical safety, and fear for our health. That's programmed into us. That, that's deep in our instinctual bank. That, you know, we come into this, 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 this world, and the same as you have an immune system. And the immune system is to, you know, you have little patrols police patrolling your system, knocking out cancer cells and other <coughs> things and viruses and so on. They're protecting you, but you also have a psychological and an emotional and a moral immune system, and that is and a physical immune system where you're walking around. You're careful. You don't want to die. And so we're always afraid of anything that's, that's going to somehow threaten our physical health. It's going to threaten our lives in some ways. <coughs> So we lock our doors at night, we get alarm systems, um, some people carry guns, whatever. But we do things because we're physically afraid and we need to be. That comes from nature. Like Robert um, Redford says, my brother was this wonderful guy, never afraid of anything in his life. Of course he died young. All of us, and we're in this room, and we're still alive because we've been a lot, afraid a lot in our lives. And we've locked doors and taken care and taken proper safety precautions and sometimes been paranoid about our safety. Um, that can be very healthy. But we're not just physical. We also, all of us, unless we're psychopaths, have deep fears about our emotional and psychological health. 
Sometimes we don't word it like that, and oftentimes, in fact, to our detriment, we don't understand it like that. You know, I'll give you an example. Um, if you want what I think consider one of the great oxymorons in the English language, and that's this when they talked about safe sex. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Well, today we, we give people the impression that if you're contraceptively and disease-wise responsible, you have safe sex. No, it's not safe at all for young people. It's not safe emotionally for these kids. It's not safe for them morally. It's not safe in many other ways. See, and, and at a deeper level we intuit this. You know, if you're a sensitive person, at times you just know, I shouldn't be hanging around with this crowd. I shouldn't be part of this conversation, and so on. And certain kinds of things frighten us, okay? And that's healthy. We're, we feel psychologically unsafe. We feel emotionally unsafe in certain situations. Um, that, that's a healthy fear. And that also spills over morally. That at a certain point, you know, that all sensitive people have certain moral fears. And we express them. In fact, we express them strongly on election day and so on. So today, what is this country most deeply divided over beyond even economics and everything else? Moral issues, abortion, gay marriage, these things where, where people feel deeply, deeply threatened in their roots one way or another by certain moral issues. Those are moral fears and they're healthy. I mean, they can, they can be excessive, but they're healthy. Then, fear for our religious identity. Uh, again, you see how much uh, tension there is between different religions and different denominations. And a simple question to ask yourself, why? Why are Catholics and Protestants and Evangelicals and people fighting, and then people fighting within those churches? Liberals and conservatives fighting over moral issues and doctrinal issues and liturgical issues. Why is this going on? It's all fired by fear. You know, somehow someone's going to water my religion down. Somehow somebody else is, 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 is threatening my religious identity. Um, I work with a lot of younger theology students, and today so many of them are really driven by deep fears. So that sometimes I worry more that I'm concerned more that they are sometimes more concerned about what they're against than by what they're for, which is also true for us many times. You know, it's, it's, it's so important that um, so oftentimes we define ourselves and so much concern, contention, be, example, between liberals and conservatives because we're defining ourselves by what we're against. We don't believe in this. We don't believe in that. Um, so, for instance, I teach young theology students, sometimes they're more concerned that other religions be wrong than that our religion be right. Now, see, that's fired by fear, flat-out fear. Now, next, we have fear of loneliness and isolation. As we get older, sometimes that kind of fear, uh, at least during our, our, our adult generative years, can somehow lessen and disappear. See, sometimes when you're in the years where you know you're, you're childbearing and child raising and you're doing all the generative work, you actually long for solitude. <laughs> and, and the last thing you worry about is isolation. But you experience this more acutely when you're young, like young people, very strongly as a teenager. Um, that's why you get that in all these teenage songs. Who, who will love me? I'm just a lonely boy. Like, like, who, 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 who's concerned, who will I marry, where will I find love, where will I find myself? Now, we get about 40 or 50 years of grace in the middle after that, and then at a certain point we begin to age, and assisted living beckons and invites, <laughs> and society starts marginalizing us, and our health causes that, and other things are in our families, and slowly we're pushed to the side again, and then, that fear returns of isolation, of not being important, of simply falling off the radar screen. Um, that's the deep fear. It's in all of us. And those are healthy fears. And all these things, you know, I'm, I'm pulling them apart, but they're actually tied together. Uh, they're all in a, in a ball inside of us. The, which, which brings the next one, which I call the fear of being insubstantial, of being insignificant, forgotten, left out, 
and able to be special, vaporized. Now, I use the word vaporized. Um, you know that wonderful, famous text, which we all know in Scripture, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, where this is, which is probably one of the most beautiful poetic books and one of the most depressing books in all of the Bible. Um, it's written by this, this, this Koheleth, the preacher, but we know a lot of the, those texts by heart. That's the man who wrote, there's a season, there's a season for everything, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to live, a time to grow, and so on. But remember his great mantra in there. He says, vanity of vanity, everything is vanity. He says that a number of times. Life is just vanity. And we always misinterpret that. Because in English, the word vanity has to do with a false pride. You know, he's a very vain man. She's vain about her looks. You know, you're, you're, you're going to buy some really expensive clothing and say, well, this, this is vanity. That's not what he means at all. He's talking about our mortality. And for him, vanity in Hebrew, the word he's using, it means vapor. It means like a cloud, a mist. So his concern is not so much that he's vain or, or, or that life is vain in the English sense. It's that life is transitory. You come, you pass, you're gone, you're forgotten. And your life is real brief. You come and we simply disappear. Vanity of vanity. Transitoriness of transitoriness. We're just vapor. We come, we're here for a little bit, we disappear, we're gone, we're insubstantial. And you know, inside of all of us, there is a deep, irrepressible pulse uh, against that, and that is a fear that we're going to disappear. And because of that, we have this powerful pressure to make somehow make ourselves immortal. You all know the line, you know, plant a tree, have a child, write a book. Why do any of those three? Because each of them in some way leaves a mark. See, you die, but you have children. You die, but the oak tree you've planted is going to be around for the next 300 years. You die, but you've left a book, you've left an opera, you've left something, you've left your, your, your name is engraved on, on some trophy, you've, you've done something, you've left a mark. See, we have this deep fear of disappearing, <clears throat> or as Kohelet says, of being vaporized. That we simply, we're going to live, we're going to die, and we don't leave a mark. Um, in the Bible, it's interesting, the New Testament, Jesus calls that anxiety. So remember how often Jesus says, don't be anxious. Remember, don't be anxious. Consider the lilies of the field. They don't spin, but Solomon in all his glory didn't look as beautiful as a lily of the field. Consider, you know, the birds of the air, or a sparrow is the most insignificant bird, but God has it firmly on his radar screen. Um, see, we're always afraid we're going to somehow disappear. A priest friend of mine, I love this, he puts this in his standard homily on this. And he says, you know what our deep fear is? Is this. Have you ever had this happen to you? Where uh, you're going to your closet and you're looking for an item of clothing. And while you're looking for it, you find another item of clothing that you completely forgot you had. So you're looking, all of a sudden you see a blouse and say, my God, I still got this blouse. He says, unconsciously, that's our fear, that someday God's going to look down and say, my God, she's still alive, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Completely forgot about Mary or forgot about Jack, you know? And see, so we want to make sure, so we're going to put some kind of mark on this planet. That's what St. Paul calls boasting. We're always trying to boast. He's not saying about that we're bragging. We're trying to do something uh, which we can't do for ourselves, because only God can do that. You know, this is a beautiful text. And when Jesus sends out the apostles on their very first missionary experience, and they go out, and apparently this went pretty well. Mark said they came back, and they were full of excitement. And they said, we cast out demons, and we heal people. We did all this wonderful work. And Jesus says, that's wonderful. He said, but don't rejoice in that. Don't rejoice in your achievements. If Rejoice instead that your names are written in heaven. See, God has us locked on the radar screen. That's why Jesus says, um, not a hair will fall from your head, and not a sparrow will fall from the sky except God notices. See, God has us, but 
we, we, we know that at some level of faith, but we don't know that deep down. So that, that's in all human beings. There's this drive to somehow make ourselves immortal. Why? Because we're afraid we're going to disappear. There's this deep fear of our own insignificance, our own falling off the radar screen, our own, we're going to be forgotten, we're going to be vaporized. Vanity of vanity, everything is vanity. You don't interpret that in terms of pride. Transitoriness, transitoriness, everything is going to disappear. Today there's fog clouds out there, the wind's going to come and sweep them away and the sun's going to burn them away. Um, this is what Koheleth is saying, our lives are just that. We're here briefly and stuff's going to sweep us away, we'll disappear. Then, the fear of being contingent, small, vulnerable, and somehow guilty before an eternal reality which isn't always benign. You know when you analyze in this section next, I want to talk about some of the great Greek myths that capture that, that um, in Greek mythology. And a lot of these myths are very old, they're very powerful, and they're very deep. And they're very religious in their own way. And they express some of the deep religious fears. But part of those myths, you, you always have a sense that, that we're, we're this small little creature and somehow we're against the divine reality which isn't perceived as divine. So, as an example, uh, the myth of Prometheus. Uh, the myth of Prometheus goes this way. So Prometheus was this Greek hero, okay? And remember those myths are always says, in the beginning. And in the beginning means before time, and they've somehow created time the way it is now. There was this character called Prometheus it worked this way. The gods had fire. See, Prometheus is the man who stole fire from the gods. So the gods have fire, and they, they believed in a pantheon of gods. There wasn't monotheism yet. So the gods are the eternal creatures in, up in the sky, and they have fire so they can cook food, they have light, and they can heat, make themselves warm, and they won't share it with humanity. So Prometheus sneaks into heaven and steals fire from the gods and brings it down and since then we've had fire. The gods can rain all they want, we have it in caves and in houses, they can never get the fire out again. So human beings have fire, but for that we're somehow eternally punished, you know. So Prometheus was chained to a rock and he had a vulture pecking away at his liver forever. Not a healthy thing at all, you know. <laughs> but when you unpackage that, there's a lot in there. See, what's in there? First of all, the gods are not benign, and somehow we got to steal immortality and life and heat and warmth from them, and we've already done it, but because of that, there's something inside of us that isn't right. See, there's kind of a guilt. Something's pecking away at his liver. That's a metaphor. You know, for many people, we go with our lives unconsciously, something is pecking away at our liver. <coughs> okay. There, there's something inside of us that isn't healthy. I'll talk about it later. When you ever had this experience where you feel good and life is really, you're healthy, your family's together, everything's going well, you're enjoying something, then you feel so guilty about feeling good that you don't feel good anymore. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, uh, religions argue about who has the monopoly on this. See, Catholics call that Catholic guilt. Um, I have Presbyterian friends who assure me that we're amateurs at this. <laughs> that they say Catholics don't get guilt at all. Presbyterian friend, and minister, friend of mine, he says, you know, he says, I always envy Catholics. He said, because in Roman Catholicism, there is only one sin, and that's sex, and you can go to confession. He said, I grew up in, 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 in a Presbyterian, he said, everything was a potentially a sin. You know, he said, like, um, or, or Baptists said, we, we, we can't dance or drink liquor or whatever and feel guilty about everything. So um, we, we struggle with that. We have deep religious fears. And, and the, the Greeks, what a wonderful metaphor. They have a, a vulture pecking away at this guy's liver because he somehow offended the gods. Okay. Inside of us, we all have that going at some minor or major level. There is a vulture pecking away at your liver. Because inside of you, you're afraid that somehow you've offended some God. See, so much of our guilt, we just don't feel good. We have, this, we have these guilt complexes. 
And I said, religions argue about it. Or the Jews say, we invented the concept. So Catholics may not steal it. But <laughs> later on, I'm, at the end of this talk, I want to talk about where this guilt complex comes from. Why do we feel this? Why do we have these guilty religious fears? Now, the Greeks put it into their myths. And for them, that, but the whole idea is we're small, we're vulnerable. Go out at night, some night on a clear night. Go by yourself and just look at the stars and just feel how small we are and insignificant and so on. Um, we're a small piece. The philosophers like Thomas Aquinas, they call that our contingency. Thomas Aquinas says, we're contingent beings, uh, which means we're small, we're little, and inside of that we feel that, and there's, there, there's a fright inside of that. Okay, then fear that our powers are somehow challenging the divine. Well, I've talked about that. Um, I've talked about it in terms of the myth of Prometheus, but with us, oftentimes, it comes out in all kinds of subtler and smaller and sometimes psychological ways. So that for many of us, you know how this fear expresses itself? It's a certain fear of achievement. It's a certain fear of stepping out on a stage and being a great man or a great woman. Even an example. You know, when you look at people just in our culture that have stepped on the world stage and have become great men and women. So if somebody like Mother Teresa, uh, notice when you look at Mother Teresa how little you see any kind of fear in her life other than a reverential fear. Or John Paul II. John Paul II could stand in front of the whole world and say, I love you and it's very important you hear this from me. You and I couldn't say that our tongue would break off. I don't know that. Oh, from so, no. we, see, we're, we're afraid because um, we're afraid that, that somehow by doing that we'd be challenging the divine. We, except we, we experience it this way. We don't experience it the way Prometheus did or Sisyphus. We experience it this way. We start thinking, you know, if I step out and if I say that, they're going to say, who does she think she is? My God, and she's just this kid from Belleville, Illinois. And, and so we, 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 we self-censor, we, we put ourselves down because um, we're afraid. We're so deeply afraid of like, who am I to do that? And if I do that, I'm going to somehow offend somebody or ultimately the divine. And people say, who does he think he is? You know, notice Mother Teresa or John Paul II or Nelson Mandela, whoever, that's the last thing that ever meant, entered their mind. And when people did say to them, who do you think you are? They'd say, well, I'm a child of God, and God has gifted me in this way, and I need to do this. Uh, you and I, if someone said, who do you think you are? We would just melt, and we go back into the fear that, that drove this. So that we have this fear about that somehow we're challenging the divine. I like the way the Greek myths put that. All of these things are interrelated, as you can see. Fear of our own complexity as somehow violating the sacred, especially so through sexuality. It's interesting. This is in all cultures. Sometimes Catholic thinks, Catholics think we have this. Protestants think they have it uniquely or whatever. It's in all cultures. This has been studied transculturally and so on. And the whole idea that somehow, <clears throat> particularly in our sexuality, we are offending God. And there's a fear of, um, even though there's a lot of sexuality going on, um, there's always a fear and, and, and um, the way we've, through the years, uh, struggled with sex in all cultures, in all religions. That sex somehow is dirty, but somehow sex is the, the major sin, or somehow sex is something which can't be integrated into spirituality and the divine. I'll give you an example. Um, it's a strong one. Uh, for instance, as Roman Catholics, I'm a Roman Catholic, um, you'll see so, how, how, how we have struggled to ever attribute any kind of sexual complexity to Jesus, to Mary, to our saints, to Mother Teresa. It's simply impossible for us to do that. It's simply impossible for us to think of Jesus or Mary or Mother Teresa or some holy person as being wholesomely sexual. It doesn't mean that we have to believe that, that Jesus and Mary weren't celibate or whatever. That's not the point. We simply we can't project sexuality into that. I'll give you an example. 
some years ago, um, when Nikos Kassenzakis, the great Greek writer, when he wrote that book called The Last Temptation of Jesus. Now, Martin Scorsese turned that into a movie, and uh, I can honestly say it, it wasn't a good movie, <clears throat> not because of the theology in it. It was simply, it, I think it failed as a work of art. Scorsese was trying to do something artistically, and it just didn't translate. I'm sure he wants this film buried pretty deeply in some files, you know. But that wasn't what he was criticized about. In fact, when the book came out from Cass and Zach, it was condemned by the church, okay. And if you ever read the book, now don't do the movie. Um, the movie's a bad piece of art. The book is a masterpiece of art. First of all, even the way he wrote it. You know, you know the way Cass and Zach wrote this book? He went to Jerusalem or, or to Israel for three years and for three years he walked all the places where Jesus walked. He stayed out overnight. He spent 40 days in the desert. He tried to do everything exactly as Jesus did it. As Ignatius would say, he tried to apply that right to his senses. And he worked himself to the very edges of a nervous breakdown. Then he wrote this book, which is a powerful piece of literature. Then he sequestered himself in a hotel room for about six weeks. And he, just, he wrote this, 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 this masterpiece. And when he came out, he was about two years in recovery. Now, that's how much intensity and passion he put into it. But he got, he got uh, panned for this. The lo what was the last temptation of Jesus? Well, in Kassenzaka's book, it works this way. Jesus, he was a Greek Orthodox, so he was very Orthodox. Jesus was God and Jesus was divine. But for Kassenzaka, Jesus struggled as a human being <clears throat> he struggled with being a reluctant Messiah. He knew he was the Messiah, but he didn't want to be because he wanted to be just an ordinary man. What he wanted to do was to marry Mary Magdalene, retire in the desert and raise sheep and have barbecues on Saturday night, you know, <clears throat> which is what ordinary people want to do. Get married, have kids, you know, raise your kids, raise sheep, just, you know, have a quiet life and let somebody else save the world. And then, of course, this culminates on the cross. When Jesus is on the cross dying in this book, this great temptation comes back. So the temptation is, he's God, and he could get off the cross. He could invoke divine power, come off the cross, bang a few heads below there, and then take Mary Magdalene, go out to the desert, get married, raise sheep, and raise kids. And so that's his great temptation, but he doesn't do it. He does give himself over and dies the way he dies in Scripture. So I want to ask you, what's wrong with that? First of all, it's good theology, it's good Scripture. Remember, Scripture tells us Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, except he didn't sin, which means Jesus was also tempted sexually. But as Christians, we simply cannot handle that. We simply can't. And this isn't just Catholic, just as Christians. We can't do this. Why? Because there's still a deep feared fear that somehow sexuality stands in the way. Somehow sexuality, um, it's going to offend the divine. Somehow you can't read sexual complexity into Jesus or into Mary or into Mother Teresa. Um, we can't do it. It's just impossible for us to do. That's all based in deep fear. That's, that's a fear. and we, we need to look at that and eventually unpackage it and so on. And you're going to see, or <clears throat> let me point this out now, psychologists, and especially some of the neo-Freudians, have studied this very, very deeply, psychologically, and I think have studied it very profoundly. And they'll say that in, in our culture, um, we have a deep fear of sex, and as I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, we also have a deep fear of enjoyment, and we have a deep fear of pleasure. And because of that, what happens, we try to compensate by excess. Get this? It's because we can't really enjoy pleasure, <clears throat> then we go to excess. That's not complicated, which means because somebody can't enjoy one really good drink of alcohol, we drink 15 drinks. You know, because we can't enjoy uh, a meal, we overeat. See, in our culture, we're so much given to excess. Excess, everything overdone. You know, the old expression, tonight I'm going, going, I'm going to a party and I'm going to have a good time if it kills me. <laughs> well, it'll probably kill you and you're not going to enjoy anything. See, the very thing about excess 
excess, which always leads to there's a certain addictive quality to it, you don't enjoy it. You know, you can't because it's driven by excess. But underneath that, as the Neo Freudians point out, there's deep fear. There's somehow a fear that it's not right to enjoy this pleasure. And the greater the pleasure, the greater the in inhibition. So the greatest pleasure is sex. That's where we have the most inhibitions and fears about sex. Um, and connect them to religion. Okay, then fear of intimacy, fear of pleasure and enjoyment. I want to wrap those two together. It's interesting. In our lives, there's nothing we want more than pleasure, enjoyment, and intimacy. Or I should probably reverse that. Intimacy, enjoyment, and pleasure. And yet, we have these deep fears. You know, like we have this deep, deep need and want for intimacy. And um, so why is it so hard for us to attain it? Because at the same time, it's also our deepest fear. See, at the, at the center of our souls, we are longing for a soul mate. And a lot of people spend their lives looking for their soul mate, and it isn't so much that the right person isn't out there. But we always have this, you know, Hollywood fantasy that, you know, there's this one right person in the whole world, but yours might be over in India or Pakistan, you're not going to meet the person, so you're going to spend a futile life here, and you're never going to meet your soulmate because this person isn't around. Um, more likely, this is the case. There's soulmates out there, but we never ever let them into our souls. Um, there's this, these, we, deep inside of us, we have this, this need for intimacy, but at the same time we're struggling. We're always struggling with a deep fear to let anybody in there. So today, you see it on the surface very, very strongly in terms of a fear of commitment. You know, you look at our culture, it's almost characterized by fear of commitment. Oh, I'll live with somebody, I won't get married, keep my options open, and so on. Uh, we're looking for intimacy, but we're deeply afraid of it. We're deeply afraid to ever do the things to let somebody in there. Deep fears. Deep fear of pleasure, deep fear of enjoyment, which drives us, as I said, to excess. Um, so you can take that line to the back. Excess is always a substitute for genuine enjoyment. And the reason we go to excess again, the deep culprit is fear. That somehow um, we're afraid just to take pleasure. Uh, let me give you an example of that. And we're not unique. This is these are innate things inside of humanity. <clears throat> There's an incident in the scripture with Jesus. And it's interesting, it's recorded in all four Gospels. And scholars tell you when something's in all four Gospels, it's really, really important. Because even the birth of Jesus isn't recorded in all four Gospels. And that's the famous incident where this woman comes into a house and anoints Jesus' feet and dries him with her hair. And it goes this way. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The imagery and the lavishness of the imagery is meant to shock and scandalize you. And it does when you look at it. And it's shocked and scandalized the people in the room. So it works this way. They said, one night, Jesus was at the house of Simon the Pharisee. And it seems this was a, a rich man. So he wasn't dining in a soup kitchen that night. He, he's at the house of a rich man. He's at a banquet. And into this banquet comes a woman who is a known prostitute in the town. An image of she's wasted her love, okay? And in her hand, she has an alabaster jar. It's the most expensive jar you could buy, the Waterford crystal of the time. And it's full of spikenard ointment, the most expensive ointment you could buy. She goes to Jesus' feet and she breaks the jar. So she's wasting it. This beautiful crystal, only going to be used once. Okay, talk about expensive wrapping paper. Okay, then she it pours the entire jar of ointment on his feet. Wasteful, and it said the aroma filled the entire room. Then she began to cry on his feet and began to dry his feet with her hair. You can't write imagery that's more luxurious and scandalous than that. And so the people in the room begin to shift uncomfortably. They say, this shouldn't be happening. All this waste, this woman, 
the innuendo of sexuality, the gender thing, the waist, this, the perfume. The and Jesus, notice that Jesus says, leave her alone. He said, she has just anointed me for my impending death. The poor you'll always have with you. You won't always have me. But Jesus is saying, they're saying, this shouldn't be happening. Jesus says, yes, it should. And not only that, you should learn something from it. These moments, those are the highlight moments of our entire lives. When Jesus says, she has anointed me for my impending death, he's not just saying that, although he is saying that. He's not just saying, you know, I'm going to be dead in some weeks. And it's better that she puts that on my, on my feet when I'm alive than she puts it on my grave when I'm dead. You know, there's a whole motif in that. Uh, when are you going to get the most flowers and the most compliments and the most expressions of affection in your whole life? At your funeral. <laughs> Jesus said, don't do it at the funeral, do it when the person's alive. So he's saying she's doing a good thing. She's not putting flowers on a dead man's grave, she's putting love on a, on a live person's feet. But more importantly, he's also saying, when I come to die, I'm going to be more ready, because tonight, of all the lives and nights of my life, I am fully alive. This is what you live for. And you know what, that's true for us, but, but when, when it happens, we're too guilty, we're too fearful to ever drink it in. Like, we really struggle, again, in all the churches and in a secular culture, we, we truly struggle to simply enjoy and, um, and drink in goodness. You know, so Jesus scandalized people. Jesus scandalized people with his capacity to enjoy life. He also scandalized them with his capacity to give it away. Um, it's interesting, I'm not sure how often I've experienced this or how often you've experienced this, but how often have you heard your church preach to you the importance or, or the challenge to enjoy? How often have you heard a homily say, look, it's very, very important that you enjoy pleasure. It's always the opposite, careful, 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 careful. And th that has its own value. You're going to see fear is a complicated thing. They're preaching something valuable, but at the same time, we're only getting half the equation. Jesus preached the importance of caution, and he equally preached the challenge of simply drinking life, the, the, the challenge of pleasure. Um, but again, we're so blocked by our fears. Okay, the fear of, for the life and safety of our loved ones, this is clear and it's easy. Um, as adults, we aren't just afraid for ourselves all of you in this room, your parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts and you have friends and loved ones and you're afraid for their safety and for their health and for their moral safety as, as much as you are for your own. Then the fear of disappointing others, um, that, that's what Ellis Miller, the great neo-Freudian calls the drama of the gifted child. There's a very famous essay written at the tail end of last century which is only you know, 13 years ago. Um, but Alice Miller, the Swiss psychologist, wrote a very famous book called The Drama of the Gifted Child. And the gifted child for Alice Miller isn't Bill Gates' daughter or somebody with, a, with an incredible IQ. It's you. So the gifted child is this. It's the opposite of the person that, that Robert Redford describes when he says, my brother was born, this beautiful guy, wasn't afraid of anything. The gifted child is the sensitive child that's born that's afraid of most everything. Ellis Miller said there's, a, there's a, a sensitive child, and I suspect you all are, that's why you're in this room. You know, you're born, and from the time you come to consciousness, you have deep anxieties about measuring up, about not displeasing, about not, you know, you don't want to be a bad person, you don't want to disappoint your parents, you don't want to disappoint your teachers, you don't want to disappoint your church, you don't want to disappoint your children, you, don't want to, you, you, you want to measure up. And that's the drama. See, notice in all of that, you're afraid. You're afraid you're going to disappoint. You're afraid you're not going to be a good person. You're, going to, you're afraid of this, you're afraid of that, you're afraid of, you're afraid of many things. Now, the next hour we're going to have to look how much of that is healthy and how much of that is unhealthy. You see, some of that is very, very healthy. Insensitive people hurt <coughs> a lot of people. And sometimes you wish they were simply a lot more sensitive. Sensitive people live with a lot of depression, but uh, they're usually generative and don't hurt a lot of people. 
See, so you're, you're, you are in my fears that, you know, I better not be a bad person. I better, that, that's also partly very, very healthy. Partly it's very inhibiting. Okay, then fear of not violating, of violating others or the world. Fear is reverence or fear is chastity. I'll come back to that the next hour. Um, that's what scripture calls the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's, that's fear where you, you, you don't want to hurt somebody. You don't want to violate somebody. In fact, that's what the word chastity means. Long before chastity is a sexual concept, it's just a human concept, which means I need to be patient, I need to be reverent, I need to be respectful, so I'm not violating somebody else's boundaries. Okay, that's a fear. Fear of violating somebody's boundaries. Fear of being impatient. And so on. Fear of being impatient with God. That's the fear of the Lord that brings wisdom. Okay, then I want to move this on because I want to do the last part. Fear of having one's shortcomings and weaknesses exposed. Quite, quite simply, the fear of humiliation. The fear of humiliation. Interesting, and we can take some consolation from Jesus. You know, when Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is praying, Father, let this cup pass from me. What was the cup he was talking about? Okay, well, the cup was crucifixion. But crucifixion was designed by the Romans, not just as capital punishment. It was designed to inflict pain, but particularly it was de designed to absolutely humiliate a person publicly. So crucifixion, its deepest pain was humiliation. And that's why we, you know, we've sanitized that, but you know, they, they would strip the person naked, you know, so that their genitals would be exposed and so on. So what Jesus is saying, let this cup pass from me, he's also afraid not just of dying or the pain. And in fact, scripture, unlike Mel Gibson, scripture de-emphasizes that pain to emphasize the humiliation and the isolation. So Jesus was going to be horrifically, publicly humiliated. And he was afraid of it. And we're always afraid of any kind of humiliation. And partly that's a very healthy fear. That's, we, we protect ourselves. You know, why do I say it's healthy? I'll come back on this. Psychologists will tell you, when we enter clinical depression in, in serious phases, when we're clinically depressed and need medical help and so on, one of the first signs is we're no longer afraid of this. You don't bother washing you don't care how you look, you don't care what people think of you, you know. See, we can be over-concerned of how we look, what people think of us, and so on, but we can be under-concerned. See, part of that is very healthy. When we enter, when we become sick, at a certain point in clinical depression, you don't care. You don't care what we look like. Don't bother washing, don't bother combing your hair, don't bother how you dress, and so on. See, that's, that's a pathology that's on health. Okay, uh, let me just jump ahead to the last two. Um, fear of fear as a neurosis. And I'll come back on that the second hour. That part of the fears that we, uh, some of these fears you can see are very, very healthy. Some of them are not healthy. Um, and some of our fears are purely neurotic. Now I want to give you a very simple definition. Don't let the word neurosis scare you. First of all, all of us in this room, I think I can say this without offending anybody, we're all highly neurotic, okay? Uh, and cheer up because Freud, because Freud says neurosis is the disease of the normal person. <laughs> See, if you're psychotic, you don't want to be that. You know, that's your other option, okay? Um, psychos psychotic people have no fears at all, okay? Uh, that's the fear of the normal person. So we're oversensitive and so on. So, so many of our fears are, are rooted in our, in our oversensitivity. And then we have fear as a phobia. Phobia is, um, unlike neurosis, a phobia is not a neurosis. A phobia is something else. That we don't get that from Freud, we get that from Jung. A phobia is something we inherit. Um, you know, when you're born and you may be afraid of the dark or you may be afraid of heights and that may have nothing to do with you at all or you're afraid of fires because maybe your great-grandmother's aunt or your great-grandmother was caught in a fire and you've inherited this genetically and so on. Um, those are other kinds of fears. Now, I want to tie this together. When you look at this, and, and, and I know this has been a very, a big ball of many things and that's been delivered so you don't have to have any clarity yet. I want to try to pull this together now. 
the clarity is this, that inside of that, <coughs> you see this, this sphere is this big ball. It's just a steaming pot of lots of stuff. And our religious fears come out of that. So that's the key point I want to make with this, this first time. Because we have far, far too simplistic notions of what religious fear is. You know, uh, let me give you an example. These are the two caricatures of how people define religious fears. And they define them this way. Um, the first one is where a person says, you know, I was raised as a Catholic or a Baptist or a Jew or a Presbyterian or whatever. And I was raised on, you know, we had a God up in the sky recording sins. And I was raised to be fearful. And, and you know, now I, I, I really struggle with the concept of God. And, and, and what's wrong with that? Partly it's true. Partly it's very untrue. Um, you're going to see those fears that we say we blame religion for and so on oftentimes have nothing to do with religion. They came from very different sources. They're projected onto religion, as I'm going to say later on today. You know, neuroses and uh, scrupulosities and so on, they come out in two areas. They come out in the area of sex and they come out in the area of religion. And oftentimes they're not rooted in either. Okay. See, so we blame religion simplistically for our fears. And you're going to see many of them have not to do. They're projected onto that. You know, uh, Anton Vergott was one of the, the great profs I've ever studied under. He's a psychologist in Belgium. And um, he says this, and you can check this out. Checks out in my experience, but he, he checks out in research. He says, almost all anger directed at institutionalized religion is anger directed at your own father and the different father figures in your life. Take that to the bank. Almost all anger directed at institutionalized religion is anger directed at your own father or at different father figures in your life who somehow betrayed you or who somehow didn't give you permission and so on. So we blame religion, but religion is not the culprit. Or you have another kind of um, neurosis that's, ex that's expressed, and that's the person who's, who's the recovering Catholic or the recovering Presbyterian or the recovering Christian. I'm a Christian, I'm in recovery. So they say, you know, I was raised in a church and they, they put all these guilt neuroses on me. Remember a friend of mine says, I was raised a Catholic and they taught us about poverty, chastity and obedience. And what really we really wanted was money, power and sex. <laughs> and now I can't appreciate it. I'm getting riddled with all these guilt neuroses, Catholic neuroses, or the Presbyterians call it Presbyterian neuroses, the Baptists call it Baptist neuroses, the Jews call it Jewish neuroses, and so on. Um, see, we blame religion. We blame our religion teachers. You can see very little of that comes from your religion teachers. Uh, the religion teachers told you things that help trigger other wounds you've long had, some from nature, some from nurture, but uh, those wounds were already there. So that religious fears, which we're going to look at in the next hour, is, you know, what's healthy and what's unhealthy. But I want you to see it's coming from this huge cauldron of all kinds of fears rooted in your instincts, you know, fear that for your life, for your safety, for your moral safety, your religious safety, your psychological safety, fear for your children, deep innate neuroses about guilt and sexuality and so on, many of which have nothing to do with religion. Um, but then we, we constellate them around religion. to say like, I'm, I'm too fearful and so on. And, um, and then you get people who, um, I'll talk about that the next hour too, who want us to preach that in the name of religion. I've heard this often say, Father, uh, in your writings, you never write about hell. You never write enough about sin. You never write enough saying, no, if you don't do this, you're gonna go to hell. So why aren't the church doing that anymore? Why aren't the churches preaching fear? You know something? Uh, they're right in this sense. Fear is very, very effective as a motivator. You know, when the churches preached fear, they got better results. It's true. When I was a kid, they literally scared, this is, the, they literally scared the hell out of us, you know? And we were scared to be bad. So why do we do it? Well, be, because it's the antithesis of religion. Brainwashing is very effective too, but it doesn't mean you should do it. You know, cults are effective, but it doesn't mean they're right. See, fear is a great motivator. Not just, it's also true politically. 
Oftentimes, you can win an election by getting people afraid. But it's not healthy. Fear is the antithesis of religion. Jesus said, I've come to set you free from all fear, and particularly fear of God. And so, we got to be careful that we don't preach fear in God's name. Um, but also, we, we need to be careful not to blame our fears too quickly on religion. They feel like religious fears, but they're coming out of this huge cauldron from nature, from nurture, from all kinds of reasons, many of which are really healthy. They're protecting us. Remember Redford's line, he's a beautiful guy, never afraid of anything, but he died young. You're still in this room because fear has protected you a lot. <laughs> okay. Now, it's, it's also left you uptight in many ways, but that, that's something else. Well, let me end with a quote. Um, about our conscious, unconscious, and healthy fears of God. What are we afraid of when we look at God? Fear that God is not as understanding and compassionate as we are. Fear that God is not as big-hearted as we are. Fear that God does not read the heart and cannot tell the difference between wound and coldness, immaturity and sin. Fear that God gives us only one chance and cannot bear any missteps or infidelities. Fear that God does not respect our humanity, that God created us in one way, but wants us to live in another way to be saved. Fear that God is threatened by our achievements, like a petty tyrant. Fear that God is threatened by our doubts and our questions, like some insecure leader. Fear that God cannot stand up to the intellectual and cultural scrutiny of our world and somehow needs to be segregated and protected like an overpious novice. Fear that God is less interested in our lives and less solicitous for our salvation of our loved ones than we are. And not least, fear that God is as helpless before our moral helplessness as we are. We have lots of fears. We need to look at which are healthy and which are unhealthy.